Hello, my name is Benjamin Hart. I'm an American attorney and the managing director of Integrity Legal here in Bangkok, Thailand. As the title of this video suggests, we're discussing, well, public health and control. This is obviously an opinion piece. We're discussing, well, you're going to see here shortly, there's, we're basically discussing the response, if you will, or this continuing response to, or what they say is the response to COVID-19 here in Thailand. But specifically, we're talking about the alcohol policy here. And it kind of caused me to have something of an epiphany here recently, which made me decide to go ahead and make this video. For those who are used to our videos, they're rather, I, I hesitate to say short, but we like to keep them concise. This will probably be a comparatively longer video, so go ahead and buckle up, because we're gonna do a deep dive on all of this. And as you'll see here shortly, a publication that came to my attention just caused me to kind of go into a rather deep rabbit hole on this. And if you want to travel down the rabbit hole with me, please feel free to be my guest. We're going to go ahead and get into this right now. So this all started when I read a recent article from Thai Visa. That's ThaiVisa.com. And the article is titled, Reopening Bars, People Drinking Al Alcohol Are Difficult to Control and risk spreading the virus. I mean, okay, let, let me just, we'll keep, we'll keep on rolling here. Uh, unlike a lot of our videos where I like to do excerpts, I'm gonna go ahead and read this whole article. It's rather short because I'm gonna break down a lot of this sort of point by point. Quoting directly, the Committee for COVID-19 Situation Administration has placed the blame squarely with drinkers of alcohol for not opening pubs and bars in Thailand. Dr. Apisamai Srirangsan said the CCSA sympathized with the industry after they begged the government, and I mean begged, we've done, we've done to, to kind of get into an editorial here, we've done multiple different articles or multiple different videos on the state of play with respect to the food and beverage industry most assuredly, and just SMEs in Thailand, and it's desperate out there. Yes, begged is not an overstatement. They begged, quoting further, the government to let them reopen the multi-billion baht industry last week. But, she said, infections of the COVID-19 COVID are caused by the, and I quote, actions of the people, unquote. We'll get into that in a minute. And people drinking alcohol make it hard to control situations, reported Siam Rath. Quoting further, she said they lose their restraint making bars and pubs hotbeds for the potential spread of the virus. She urged pubs and clubs to demonstrate how they can mitigate this tendency and show how they can reopen safely. Tyvisa notes that such comments are likely to inflame the industry leaders who say they have fallen over backwards to ensure safe environments for people to enjoy a beverage. What is a massive industry in Thailand? What is a massive industry in Thailand is currently on its knees, begging to be included in other businesses that have been allowed to reopen this week and in recent days. Yet the authorities, with the good doctor included, continue to blame drinkers above most others. Now, let's go through some of this here and let's break this down. First of all, who are we talking about? Dr. Apisamai. Sri Rangsan said the CCSA sympathized with the industry. I'm sure that sympathy is, is of great comfort to folks who are barely surviving as a result of not being able to make a living during this situation. That said, I was curious as to who, what are the qualifications of Dr. Apisamai Sri Rangsan? So I'm not doing this to cast dispersions at anyone. I'm not doing this to bring this up, to be hypercritical. Why am I pointing out, why am I getting into this? Well, this is the spokesperson. This is the person who's being quoted. Also, and we did another video on this a couple months ago when they started this new non-lockdown or whatever you want to call this thing. The, and they quoted a child psychiatrist or child psychologist who was saying that, you know, ties can't control themselves, which was just, I, we did another video. It's, the title of it is, so Thailand or a nation of children is basically the, the title of the video where we got into that. And it, when I first saw this, I was kind of curious if this was the same person. Who
who was this? So I went ahead and did a deep dive, try and figure out who this is. Now, let's go ahead and put this on screen. This is from Wikipedia. Dr. Apisamai Srirangsan, nicknamed Birth, was Miss Thailand 1999. She competed in the Miss Universe 1999 pageant competition held in Trinidad and Tobago as the last Miss Thailand title holder to compete. Currently, she works as the director of Bangkok Hospital Rehabilitation and Recovery Center, Bangkok, Thailand. And then if, we, if you go down here, news presenter, Channel 7, looks like Channel 7, NBT, uh, Channel no, uh, 131. So channel, so news presenter and former Miss Thailand. And then on January 14th, 2021, during the COVID-19 pandemic in Thailand, she was appointed assistant spokesperson for COVID-19 Situation Administration at CCSA by the CCSA board led by Prayut Chano Cha. So, okay, then I went over here and we'll put this up on screen too. This is from the web website of Bangkok Hospital. That's bangkokhospital.com. She's an MD, Kong Ken University, uh, specialty in psychiatry. So again, uh, as I said in the last video that we did regarding our ties to be treated like children, and this one, you know, it begs the question, and forgive me, why is a psychiatrist talking to us about communicable disease? I understand it's an MD, you know, I, I do get that. But for example, I'm an attorney. You know, I do, I do a fair amount of general practice, but to talk to me about maritime law, which is a very specific set of law, and it's sort of unrelated to anything I otherwise do, for me to go out there and be sort of just talking at length about maritime law, which is something I don't have a great deal of experience in, I've dealt with some things that, uh, dealing with, for example, maritime law, or you know, patent law, for example, don't, I personally haven't dealt a lot with patent law. There's just certain things that are outside of my bailiwick. So forgive me if I come across as a little bit incredulous when hearing some of these things from a former Miss Thailand news presenter with a medical degree, certainly, and a specialty in psychiatry. And why is it that all of the people that are spokespeople for this thing are in psychiatry or psychology? Why, where are the epidemiologists that are talking to the public? Where are the virologists out there? I do understand there is no pandemic specialist in, in a sense. You know, but where, again, where, where are the virologists? Where are the epidemiologists, the immunologists? Where, where are those folks? Internal medicine people. Where, where are they? in all of this. So th that's just kind of the beginning. I, I'm not, this is, this is just the person who's been sort of slated to be the spokesperson for the CCSA, but I would be very curious to see if a virologist made this, this statement. And to quote this again, she said, infections of COVID-19 are caused by the quote, actions of people, unquote. What kind of statement is that. People do not cause coronavirus. The virus causes infection of coronavirus. I've done another video on this channel. I urge those who are watching this who haven't seen it to check it out. It's called, it's just go into our search function. It's called proximate cause. The proximate cause of the virus is the virus itself. As I said in that video, if you have a tornado and the winds of a tornado knock the door off of a house, you can't say that, oh, because you put your house in a certain place, that tornado knocked that door off and caused me damage. No, the proximate cause of the door hitting someone or something is the tornado, not the location of the house. The proximate cause of a virus and infection therefrom is the virus. The people that inadvertently end up in the chain of transmission, and let me be clear on this, inadvertently, if you know you have coronavirus and you intentionally go out of your way to either spread it or you just negligently don't care and let someone get it, that's one thing. I'm not talking about that, but the infection 
by the coronavirus is not caused by, quote, actions of the people or actions of people, unquote. It's caused by the virus. And, and I do have some qualification to make that statement because that's a legal notion. That's not, a, that's not purely medical. Yes, I understand people can inadvertently be in the chain of transmission. But I can inadvertently be in the chain. I mean, we as humanity have been inadvertently in the chain of transmission to how many countless viruses since the dawn of time. We have inadvertently been in the chain of transmission of how many colds and bacterias since the dawn of time. There is nothing in the legal codes of this earth anywhere that creates a burden or duty on people if they're inadvertently in the chain of transmission of a disease. Because you can't do that. It, it, people could never move around. They could never do anything if that was the standard. They, they couldn't leave their house ever because there's an off chance they may inadvertently be in the chain of transmission of a virus. So let's, let's go back to that. I just want to reiterate on that. Infections of COVID-19 are caused by the, quote, actions of people. Sorry, I'm just not buying that. Moving forward. And people drinking alcohol make it hard to control situations. Well, so what is this about then? Because, because alcohol has not been a main feature of many of the quote-unquote lockdowns we've seen throughout the world. The, this hasn't, the, and, and I'm going to get into places where it has been here in a moment, but what, where does this come from? And all of this is, it's all put out there predicated on this, it's, it's, it's presented as if there's this self-evident notion that these lockdown measures work, that this is how we need to be handling this. Rather than, quite frankly, as I felt that Prayut pointed out rather well, where he said, we just have to learn to live with this. You know, and my opinion is, I think we need to learn to live with it a lot more quickly than 120 days from now, but leave that where it's at. We do need to learn to live with this. We've learned to live with every other disease since the dawn of time. And we haven't locked down countries, we haven't made economies completely eviscerated and moribund, and we certainly haven't said that diseases are caused by actions of people. Because they're not. They're caused by diseases. Diseases cause disease. Diseases cause infection. So, moving forward, as I said, she urged pubs and clubs to demonstrate they can mitigate this tendency and show how they can reopen safely. Well, this is the interesting thing, because this is predicated upon the presumption that these lockdown measures, and I know we're in Thailand, we're in a non-lockdown, notwithstanding literally everything's as closed as it can be with the exception of certain eateries till 9 p.m. here in Bangkok. But it's, it's predicated on this presumption that these lockdown measures just work, that it's just self-evident that this all just works. And look, back in April, May, June of 2020, I did not go out of my way to make a big issue about this because I didn't know what was going on. It was a pretty new phenomenon, and everybody was trying to do the best that they could. The reason I'm getting more upset about this now and I'm making these videos, one, I'm seeing people having tremendous economic hardship as a result of all of this. So, and it's, it's being based on presuppositions that at this point I can't seem to find any data that, that, that leads me to believe that this is the correct course of action, and yet, we're all being spoken to, in this case, spoken down to, in my opinion, as if this is all just self-evidently the correct course of action. And so to, that, to speak to that point, I have a few things to bring up. First of all, from the Telegraph, that's telegraph.co.uk, and this is from 3rd June 2021, quoting directly, the title being, Lockdown, quote, had no effect, unquote, on coronavirus pandemic in Germany. Scientists at Munich University found German infection rate was already falling before lockdown was imposed. 
Quoting further, a new study by German scientists claims to have found evidence that lockdowns may have had little effect on controlling the coronavirus. And I urge those who are watching this, I don't want to make a big video about lockdowns. That's not the purpose of this video. More to the point is this sort of this issue of alcohol and frankly this talking down to us the way the media has done it. It's, it's really, it's really, I found it really galling, frankly, on a personal level. But that's, that's just one. So again, this is June 3rd, 2021. And this isn't the first. Going back from December 9th, 2020 from the FEE.org, article is titled, Three Studies That Show Lockdowns Are Ineffective at Slowing COVID-19. One, The Lancet, July, quoting directly, a study published on July 21 in The Lancet, a weekly peer-reviewed general medical journal founded in 1823, indicated the government lockdowns were ineffective. Researchers collected data from, from the 50 countries that, with the most cases, and then quoting directly from that Lancet study, quote, government actions such as border closures, full lockdowns, and a high rate of COVID-19 testing were not associated with statistically significant reductions in the number of critical cases or overall mortality, end quote, the study concluded. Quoting further, uh, number two, Frontiers in Public Health, November. Similarly, a study published in Frontiers in Public Health several months after the Lancet paper found neither lockdowns nor lockdown stringency. That's interesting because one could argue this, this non-lockdown we're in with the stringency of having no alcohol associated with it that's kind of a stringency as opposed to a, you know, a feature of the lockdown, if you will. Nor lockdown stringency were correlated with lower death rates. Quoting further, uh, stringency of the me measures settled to fight the pandemic, including lockdown, did not appear to be linked with death, with death rate, end quote, the researchers concluded. And quoting further, Tel Aviv University study October Research from Tel Aviv University published in October on the website MedRxiv said that strict lockdowns may not save lives. Quoting directly, we would have expected to see fewer COVID-19 fatalities in countries with a tighter lockdown, but the data reveals that this is not the case, end quote, the researchers explained. Quoting further, in May, Bloomberg article titled, the results of Europe's lockdown experiment are in... Quoting further, there's little correlation between the severity of a nation's restrictions and whether it managed to curb excess fatalities, the report concludes. Again, there's a lot in there. I urge those to go check out FEE.org for that. And then finally, and this is from FEE.org, quoting directly, pandemics are serious problems, but the belief that they can be effectively managed by central planners who refuse to recognize the limits of their own knowledge and power poses a much graver threat to human freedom and prosperity in the long run. Yeah, you can say that again. The, the reason I found that rather interesting is this, again, is sort of presented as, as just a self-evident sort of foregone conclusion that this is the right course of action. Well, as you can see, there seems to be, and I don't know, I'm not claiming to know. Let me be clear on that. But there seems to be data out there, serious, studied, peer-reviewed data out there that suggests that perhaps this isn't the right course of action. Which brings us to the specific issue of alcohol. Now, that's kind of just talking about lockdown specifically or generally. But this specific issue, this specific stringency, if you will, this specific feature with respect to this alcohol lockdown, if you want to call it that, or alcohol ban, I, I was reading through and I sort of sift through the detritus of the internet frequently. So I, I find things that are somewhat unrelated topically that, that can be sort of pulled back into sort of a more coherent narrative, if you will. And an article I found, Late Stage Globalism, When Anything That Is Not Censored Is a Lie, authored by Mark Jeftovic, and that, that's Mark, M-A-R-K, Jeftovic is J-E-F-T-O-V-I-C, Quoting directly, it may turn out there is a situation, there is a saturation level of manufactured narrative that the public can be led to believe or tolerate, and beyond that point, it all begins to look like hyper-reality. Not only do fewer people believe it anymore, more of them are done with even pretending to believe it. With too many things that were presented to us as truthful information over the last year, 
turning out to be wrong or a lie and almost everything that was dismissed as quote already debunked conspiracy theory unquote turning out to have more substance we may be crossing that point now i thought that was really interesting when i was sort of postulating or, or positing making this video i thought that was a good way to look at it because i i'm not out there thinking that there was any narrative being created with respect to lockdowns that seemed to be the immediate thing everybody jumped on, and I can kind of see where a certain momentum grows of its own accord. But there does seem to be a narrative in Thailand, and it's exemplified, again, we'll put this back up on screen, this, this Thai visa, or it's a Thai visa article, but it's reporting what's being said. There seems to be this weird narrative, or this, in, weird may be the wrong word, strange narrative that it's just self-evident that alcohol bans are necessary to fight the coronavirus. And I don't see where the data is on that. As we just stipulated or brought to the forefront, you know, there's already some healthy disagreement. Reasonable people seem to be disagreeing, at least in the academic sphere, regarding the efficacy of lockdowns generally. So therefore, this narrative of alcohol ban, where, are we, where is this coming from? You know, my, my gut tells me, and I, I hesitate to go out too far on a limb and sort of speculate as to why someone would push this, but there seems to be kind of a puritanical bent to some folks who just don't think they don't like to drink or they don't think drinking's a good idea. But again, I, I, in this whole thing, there's no data. There's just things like this. She said they lose their restraint making bars and pubs hotbeds for the potential spread of the virus. I mean, what, what does that mean? She urged, and then this was interesting, she urged pubs and clubs to demonstrate how they can mitigate this tendency and show they can reopen safely. So again, moving back to this, where this narrative is coming from, I find it really fascinating because people, you know, they're okay to just say, we need to shut down bars and pubs. That's, that's self-evident, or that's clear. That's what we need to do. And we, and we need to keep doing this because actions of people cause infections, and it's hard to control situations. Okay, and they can become hotbeds for the potential spread of the virus. Okay, well, construction sites seem to have been hotbeds for potential spread of the virus, and there's been no advocacy for the banning of construction in Thailand. I mean, why not? Why hasn't there been a narrative surrounding that? And there is a narrative surrounding alcohol usage. Could it be because there are those that have a political agenda against alcohol usage? Is this being politicized? I'm asking the question. I'm not asking it rhetorically. I'm genuinely asking that question because I don't know. Because I'm not seeing any narrative, I'm not seeing any data to support this notion that alcohol and the actions of people spread infections. To that end, a recent article I found when sort of researching this sort of in more general sense is it appears South Africa has had similar issues with their government dealing with this sort of alcohol ban or this presumption that alcohol in and of itself is this great spreader of COVID. Recent article from Independent Online, article is titled, Government Must Show Science Behind Booze, ba Booze Sale Ban, Says Liquor Industry. And this is from www.iol.co.za. And quoting directly, Our constant call is for government to share the data that they base their decisions on with the objective of understanding the science behind the decisions so that we can find other ways in future to limit the spread of the virus while protecting the livelihoods that are supported by our sector. Not just for the Easter weekend, but for all the restrictions placed on industry over the last year. To this end, we have submitted a request in terms of the Promotion of Access to Information Act that the government explain the science behind it. We remain hopeful that the government will share the data with us in due course, he said. And he is Sibani Mangadi, 
chairperson of the South African Liquor Brand Owners Association. And just for clarification, this is from April 4th, 2021. Again, back in 2020, if this had been April 2020 or June 2020, I think people had a little bit more, they were willing to give the government a benefit of the doubt when they were putting these, these restrictions on because things were more opaque, frankly. We didn't know what this disease was. We didn't know what it could do. We're 15 months in. We know what this thing does. We know what it can do. We know the mortality rates of it. And candidly, yes, all deaths are terrible. No one wants to see anyone die. But there's a certain cost benefit I think that we can do at this point, as pointed out by this gentleman from the South African Liquor Brands, Brand Owners Association. You know, there's livelihoods at stake, seriously at stake. And I don't think people in, in this CCSA are really thinking about that. Because, you know, unfortunately, sometimes people get blinders, professional blinders on. I can do it myself. I'm a lawyer. You know, when I see a situation, I see it through the eyes of a lawyer. You know, if you're a hammer, everything you see are nails. That's, that's just how you view problem solving. So people that are looking to deal with the spread of this disease, all they're looking to is how to stop the spread of this disease. They're not looking at the wider ramifications of the policies that they may be advocating. Notwithstanding the fact I have serious issue with anybody that says, quote, actions of people cause infection. That, that in and of itself leaves me to question things. To kind of put the finest point I can on it though, I'm gonna go ahead and put this up on screen. This is from Twitter. This is from at BK Mango. As you can see, Padia at breaking point. Padia's situation is getting worse due to the fact that there have been almost no tourists for 15 months. The suffering is visible everywhere. And as you can see, there's a link to a video in there. I urge those who are watching this video, go check that out and you will really see the ramifications of these policies. And yes, at one time, perhaps, you know, it might have been necessary to take rather serious and stringent steps to deal with this. But we're 15 months down the road. And, you know, I know it's hard for some people to understand, perhaps people that don't drink, perhaps people that have a religious or philosophical problem with drinking that people like to drink and that businesses make their living from supplying people with alcoholic beverages. I, you know, I understand there are people out there who just don't fundamentally understand that. But the fact is, this is about, this, this is about public health. And public health isn't just one disease. What happens, you know, if you look in that video from that Twitter, from that Twitter uh, tweet I just put up, you know, there's people homeless throughout Padia right now. I mean, it's people who are having food insecurity issues. I mean, these are, these are problems too. And I'm not saying that just allowing drinking is going to, you know, in, in pubs or bars or even, or even just in restaurants. Maybe don't go even so far as pubs and bars, but just in restaurants, it's going to magically cure everything. But what I find really hard to watch at this point is this dismissal of everything else other than COVID and this dismissive tone in people saying things, you know, actions of people cause, cause infections. You know, bars and pubs are hotbeds for potential spread of the virus. Notwithstanding, you could arbitrarily pick other things that could be viewed as hotbeds that we're not saying need to be closed forever and ever. You know, they need to demonstrate how they can mitigate this tendency. Well, you need to demonstrate the data that shows there even is a tendency, that these are hotbeds, that there is data out there which shows unequivocally that this alcohol ban is somehow necessary to mitigate the spread of COVID-19. I would say it's not on the public to prove that what, that what they use to make their living is they need to prove themselves sort of innocent of the spread of COVID. That's not the point. First of all, that's never been how we viewed public health as actions of people cause infection. That's, that's never been how I've ever understood it. And in my opinion, if the government imposes a policy, any government, you know, this could be the U.S. too, if they impose a policy 
that is this restrictive and quite frankly, that is this burdensome on the public, shouldn't it be on them to show the data that unequivocally proves that these mandates are necessary?